My name is Greg Ivers. I'm a professor of government in the School of Public Affairs at American University, and welcome to the second chapter of my ongoing series, Hidden Civil Rights History in the Washington, D.C. area. Just over my shoulder is one of Washington, D.C.'s oldest concert venues, Constitution Hall. Built in the late 1920s, Constitution Hall is still the largest concert hall in Washington, D.C. The White House is just a few blocks to the east and the National Mall just a few blocks to the south. Both the White House and the National Mall are central to our story this morning. The hall is owned and operated by the Daughters of the American Revolution. The organization's national headquarters take up an entire city block. Constitution Hall is part of that complex. Constitution Hall has, for decades, hosted every kind of event imaginable. Concerts, local graduation ceremonies, presidential debates, plays, operas, you name it. Before the National Symphony moved to the Kennedy Center in 1971, which is located just about a mile west of here, it called Constitution Hall its home for the previous four decades. Constitution Hall was not always open to everyone. Until the mid-1950s, the Daughters of the American Revolution maintained a strict whites-only policy in all of their bookings. Our story this morning is about one of the most important civil rights milestones in Washington, D.C. history. When the DAR's refusal to allow world-renowned African-American opera singer Marian Anderson to perform at Constitution Hall in 1939, that led to a chain of events that resulted in one of the great early triumphs against Jim Crow in the nation's capital. By the early 1930s, Marian Anderson was an internationally acclaimed superstar. The Italian conductor Arturo Toscanini once said that a voice like hers was heard once in a hundred years. Important to note here is that Miss Anderson had spent most of the previous decade in Europe performing in the continent's most prestigious concert halls and before heads of state. Race was not an issue for Miss Anderson's talents abroad, but it would be when she returned to the United States in 1935. Among the very first performances she gave upon returning to America was at the White House at the invitation of Eleanor Roosevelt, who, of course, was the wife of President Franklin D. Roosevelt. Miss Anderson also began a tradition that would last for the remainder of her career, performing at Howard University, one of the nation's oldest historically black colleges and universities. In 1939, Howard University suggested to Miss Anderson that she perform at Constitution Hall. The demand for tickets was so great that Howard could not accommodate her on campus, so the university's music department applied to the DAR to use Constitution Hall. It turned down her application, saying there were no dates available in April, which is when the university wanted to host the concert. That, of course, was not true. There were plenty of open dates on the hall's calendar, just not for black artists. By mid-February, Miss Anderson's saga had become a national and international public controversy. The Marian Anderson Citizens Committee formed to publicize the disrespect shown to the opera star and to look for venues that would host her. Enter Eleanor Roosevelt. A member of the DAR, Miss Roosevelt used her nationally syndicated newspaper column, My Day, to voice her outrage about Miss Anderson's exclusion from Constitution Hall. She also resigned from the DAR, writing that, quote, they have taken an action which has been widely criticized in the press. To remain as a member implies approval of that action, and therefore, I am resigning. Encouraged by NAACP President Walter White, Mrs. Roosevelt reached out to Secretary of the Interior Harold Ickes for permission for Miss Anderson to perform on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Ickes, who had once been president of the NAACP's Chicago branch, readily agreed. Charles Hamilton Houston, the legendary former dean of the Howard Law School, who since 1935 had been the legal director for the NAACP, helped lay out the legal case for why the mall as federal property would be exempt from DC segregation laws. After all that, Miss Anderson would now have a place to perform. On April 9th, 1939, Easter Sunday, Marian Anderson gave a 25 minute concert on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial before a thoroughly integrated audience of 75,000 people. Up until then, the largest crowd ever to assemble on the mall for any reason whatsoever. The first song she sang was America, My Country Tis of Thee. But what she did was something that no one knew going into the concert, and that is she changed the third line. It's My Country Tis of Thee, Sweet Land of Liberty, of thee I sing. Miss Anderson changed it to, to thee we sing, making it very clear 
that she was as much of a part of the American tapestry as anybody else. She would end her concert with three spirituals rooted in the African American church, Gospel Train, Trampin', and My Soul is Anchored in the Lord. Now here comes the best part, some old black and white footage showing an excerpt of Miss Anderson's performance at the Lincoln Memorial. And notice the title of the newsreel, a direct poke in the eye to the Jim Crow practices in the nation's capital. The nation's most impressive Easter demonstration, 75,000 mass before Lincoln Memorial to hear Marian Anderson, colored contralto, make her capital debut at the Great Emancipator Shrine. Refusal of the DAR to let her use their hall fanned a countrywide controversy with this great gathering as the climax. The singer was invited by Secretary of the Interior, Ickes, who attends with Secretary of the Treasury, Morgenthau. Spectators include Supreme Court Justice Black, New York Senator Robert Wagner, and a host of notables. Here to listen to the voice acclaimed by many as the finest in a century. Her now famous Easter Sunday concert of 1939 would not be the last time that Marian Anderson sang on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. On August 28, 1963, Miss Anderson would lead the final program of the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom by singing the national anthem before an assembled crowd of 250,000 people, bringing full circle the journey that she began almost 25 years before at Constitution Hall. Ultimately, Marian Anderson did sing in Constitution Hall. In 1943, the DAR invited her to sing as part of a war relief effort, something she agreed to do, but only if she could sing before a desegregated audience. The DAR made an exception to its policy of still segregating people on the basis of race, and she performed before a desegregated audience, about half of which was black. In 1953, Miss Anderson would sing at Constitution Hall again as part of an ongoing series sponsored by American University. And in 1964, she would begin her farewell tour by singing in Constitution Hall. I hope you've enjoyed the second in this series on hidden civil rights history in the Washington, D.C. area, and I hope you've learned something as well.